Patrick Collins, and this is off the bench. Six out of the nine runs scored in the first three innings of the Yankees Twins, Twins game, game yeah. were home runs. One was a three run home run. That is an awesome way to start the playoffs. I mean, it, it's good to finally get to October baseball because, you know, the regular season, just like we've talked about with the NBA, it, it's too long. And there have been talks about shrinking the amount of games down, but you just got to be happy once you get to October because this is what we want to see all along. And I, I do think these wild card games make postseason baseball that much more exciting. It gives it more of a football feel where it's one and done. If you don't make that game, there is no second game. There is no, no redeeming there's no yourself. Future, there's only no. one. And both team, both home teams won, which has been great for baseball. The Yankees have been not have been mediocre at best for the last couple of years, and and they are the one team in all of sports that they need to be successful every year for that league to be I, relevant. I think so. The, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's so many Yankees fans all over the place, and, and even uh, over the in, in the rest of the world, there are Yankees fans, like kind of like very similar to Cowboys fans. But the Yankees needed to be successful this year, even though they were a young team. Like you said, after a couple of very tough seasons, getting into the playoffs with this young team, and Yankees fans are back at it. I mean, they packed the park. And it was a phenomenal game. Aaron Judge got a home run, and obviously that's what everybody wants to see. All Aaron rise. Judge, all rise to the judge. He had a fantastic year. Finally, into the playoffs, first home run. I mean, he, he's really, now, whatever he does in the rest of the playoffs is going to be cherry on top. <coughs> I really, on a side note, think that that is probably the greatest, you know, Pun, you know, play on words for a player's name of all time. Aaron Judge, all rise, here comes, or all rise for the judge. Yeah. That is awesome. And, and, and it couldn't have come at a better time and on a better team. And even though I'm not a Yankees fan, I don't know if you're a Yankees nope. fan, I have to say, like I said before, the Yankees need to be relevant for the league to be uh, exciting. Yes. And, and for the best player, honestly, someone who probably should get AL MVP, and should get rookie of the year, 52 home runs, breaks, uh, was it Mickey Mantle's home run, rookie, yeah, home, run rookie record home run record of 30, 33 or 32. This is good for baseball. Home runs, big. He's six foot seven, 282 pounds. He's good looking. He, he looks good in pinstripes. Oh, well, he is. Good looking. Okay. He is good looking. Right. It's better than a lot of, he's better, you know, he's a good looking kid. <laughs> and this, nothing about this is bad for the sport. Nothing. No. In fact, both games, we looked at the Yankees and Twins. The Twins weren't bad. It wasn't that the Yankees demolished them. The Twins just left a lot more men on base. They left eight men on base. Uh, but it was an exciting game. There was drama throughout. The Yankees pulled their starting pitcher after one out. He didn't even make it through the first inning. And they were able to pull together their bullpen, which has been phenomenal all year. Well, that whole, done. that whole first inning was a struggle for the Yankees. And in the first, and then that third inning, they just lit it up. They lit up. The Twins had a home run, very first bat. Yeah. Very first at bat, home run. Like you said, you can't start a playoff game better than that. Uh, and then we lead, it leads us into Arizona. And Arizona was another nail biter. Yeah, and, and again, another high scoring game. Arizona put together a bunch of home runs. Uh, there were so many home runs in both of these games. And then just the amount of runs scored, 31 runs scored between the two games, was the most there's ever been scored in a wild card game, uh, the two wild card games combined. And I can, I can think I can safely say that this is the most excited people have been about Arizona since 2001 when they won the World Series. They had the big unit. Yeah. They had Roger Clemens. And, and they, uh, and they not Roger Clemens, it was... Um, uh, they had Luis Gonzalez who helped them win. They, they, they had a stacked roster of all these guys who were on their last leg. And now, now they have a together. team full of players that maybe aren't household names, yeah. but they're playing well as a yes. unit. They're, they're really going the route of the Houston Astros. Yes. Where, you know, they building might from within building and with youth. And, and that is a good long-term plan. You know, they're not pulling a Patriots. They're not pulling where they're grabbing big star names to bring into their system to get one or two years out of them to get rid of them. They are really doing a good job building their system. And Arizona is a good, as, 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 
as few people don't realize, baseball in Arizona is big. It is a good baseball town. Yeah, and Colorado, um, you know, is not necessarily the best. Uh, Denver is not necessarily the best baseball town, but the game being played in Arizona certainly helped for uh, viewership and it helped for the amount of fans in the stands because they really packed it there. I, you know, Arizona is not necessarily known as being a historically sports-centric city, um, uh, state. And then the Phoenix area is not necessarily the most sports-centric city. No. So I'm su I was really surprised to see that they really, I mean, there was as much energy in that crowd as there was at Yankee Stadium. And I'm really happy to see that Colorado, there's a lot of stuff going on in Colorado. There's a lot of things. It's sort of like uh, one of the coastal cities. There's a ton of stuff to do there. And I'm glad that they've been able to see through the smoke to be able to uh, enjoy a bit. A but they of also have a young team with a bunch of kind of, you know, uh, not big name players, and they had a successful year. Obviously, both home teams won. We'll see them move on to play the best teams from both the AL and the NL. The, um, sorry, the Indians and the um, Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> Brain's working a little bit slow today. But really, the big question is, should they change the wild card process, those series, to be three game series rather than just this one and done? And this is going to be our final thought on this, but I really think that the, the season is so long that I think it is a good change of pace to shorten these series so that it is excitement. That's why this wild card elimination game has been such a big hit. They got great ratings on it for yeah. baseball. For baseball, yes. For baseball, they got great ratings, and it was exciting. And to be honest, because of this, these two games this year, because a lot of people didn't watch because they didn't think it was going to be good, yeah. Because of how great these two games were next year, you can almost guarantee that those ratings will double. Yeah. Because they're going to expect home runs. They're going to expect exciting because these guys are fighting for their playoff lives in one game. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see at least the question come up in MLB to move to three games because of the, mo the financial aspect of it, incre increasing the amount of money that can be made by the teams and potentially getting more viewership over a longer period of time. Now we've got a few-day break uh, before, uh, well, Division Series starts tonight, but you're talking about one game to get in, and do these wild-card teams deserve a three-game series? Maybe not. And when we come back, we talk NBA All-Star break. They'll test you. Try to break your will. But however loud the loudness gets, However many cheese puffs may fly, you're the driver, the one in control. Stand firm. Just wait. And move only when you hear the click that says they're buckled in for the drive. Never give up till they buckle up. Why is the NBA moved to this new all-star format? It doesn't make sense. So now what they're going to do is they're going to have the two top vote getters from the Eastern and the Western Conference draft their own players that were voted into the All-Star game. It's not gonna be East versus West anymore, which I love. And a lot of people think that this is gonna be sort of like um, fantasy football where the draft is quick, they get through, but there's a lot of, of like you said, money to be made. They're trying to, to squeeze every nickel out of this format and, and I, I think you had a point off air. They need to make the game more exciting, not the process leading up to the game. Yeah, and they thought, okay, the excitement comes from the fact they're scoring 190 points. Well, that doesn't necessarily make the games exciting because I think there are a lot of times that excitement is built from the closeness of the games, defense being played. It's not necessarily just guys jacking up long three-pointers and dunk after dunk. There's a lot more excitement that could be had if there was incentive to play well during this game. And how would we do that? I mean, obviously, you see across sports, baseball has now ended their, their all-star game. They ended the whole home field advantage that they're playing for a purpose. Uh, I, NBA is a different animal. NBA, even though it is a team sport, is not really a team sport. It's a bunch of individuals. A lot of these guys that are in the all-star break, like an Anthony Davis or a Boogie Cousins, or those guys realize their teams aren't going to make the playoffs. They realize they're not going to make it all the way to the final, so they don't care. 
So what do we do, Rick? What do we do to incentivize these players to play? Well, I know we talked off camera about potentially uh, financially incentivizing them, giving a million dollars to each player on the winning team. Would that be enough to incentivize these guys to play well? I, I don't know. We're, we've talked about the NBA regular season as being kind of a, a dumpster fire because it's pretty much set in stone, you know, despite maybe two or three surprise teams, who are going to be in the Western Eastern Conference Finals every year, and then who are going to be in the Finals. So are they going to move the Browns dumpster fire <laughs> to NBA All-Star break? Is that where they're going to move I, that I wouldn't be fire? surprised. And really, these games come down to just kind of like highlight reels. And the, if you look at a highlight reel, it's not the fact that the guy can do some amazing dunk. It's so he's the fact doing it in that traffic. In traffic over somebody. Remember all the posters when we had when we were kids? There, there's a guy posterizing another player. In these games, they don't let themselves get posterized. They just step out of the way. And, and I think it's a combination of return on investment. I don't think these the NBA looks at this as something that they want to put a lot of money into because they don't get the viewership to be able to make a lot of money off it. The other side is these players are worth so much money. They the NBA does not want to put these guys at risk for a game that means nothing. Yeah. And so they either have to get rid of the game, which I don't want because it is a no. good break, or they got to make it so this, that these games mean something. But yeah. how do you do that? You can't do it. You can't do it where it's home field advantage or no. home court advantage in the playoffs or in the or in the uh, in the finals. In, in the finals. Well, how do you incentivize it? I don't think money's going to do it either because no. these guys are making two. You know, Russell Russell Westbrook just signed a two hundred and five million dollar deal for five years. What's another million for him? Yeah, no, I, if that's the thing is these guys are making so much money. The amount of money you would have to pay to actually incentivize them is more than the money they might make from the whole and the player break. interest itself. The players don't have interest in this because think about it. Do they even do the dunk contest anymore? You, you, the last five or six years, it's been names that we've never heard of, yeah. either rookies or players who aren't stars that can jump real high. They don't want to do it. The stars don't want to do it because they don't want to risk injury. Or looking bad. Or looking bad. Or they just think it's not of any value to them. They're not create. They, they can do all this stuff during you know their uh, their pregame rituals during practice, and they can get just as many people seeing that as if they did it during the All-Star Game break. The, the issue is going to continue to be these players in the NBA, and there's been struggles for All-Star Games across all sports, but in the NBA alone, these guys aren't team players. They, you know, it's the, the era of these players being with one team for 20 years like Dirk Nowitzki are gone. You could see these players are moving around the league contract to contract. They're all banana boating or they're yeah. all going to Miami or they're all they're all gathering in, in in LA. They have no loyalty anymore. So what is their loyalty? Their loyalty is to their brand. It's yeah. not to their team. Yeah. It's to their brand. Well, in that case, let's talk about how they would draft. Because let's assume, based on the last three all-star games, we're gonna get LeBron and we're gonna get Steph Curry. So is LeBron going to pick Kyrie Irving to be on his team? I think it's different. I think the way we do it is, <laughs> is that you incentivize the top player with a lot of money. Okay. You don't do the side. You go, okay, the, and, and someone like Nike or someone like Adidas, you can throw, throw a show, shoe deal at them, a one-year shoe deal or, or something like but that. But most of these guys already have a shoe deal. All right, so then you throw 2 or $3 million for the, for the MVP of the whole entire game. That'll make it so that these players want to play hard. That's five mil. Yeah, but then you're going to have more ball hogging than we already have. Yeah, but then it, it at least will be entertaining. There will okay. be players yelling <laughs> at each true. other, possible fights. Running, running at their own teammates to get the ball. Yeah, it would be entertaining at it the least. It would be entertaining. You know, sort of like. More why, like gladiatorial games entertaining. Why though. not go the route of, of, of bringing in like you said, the draft system, and bring in two old stars, maybe a, I don't know, Charles Barkley and Shaq, or Shaquille O'Neal. Well, that would be cool. They're both on TNT. The NBA All-Star Game's on TNT. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then you could, you know, you could gain interest in the draft between the two guys, and then... I was just told it? that it's already been done. Oh. Rook rookie, rookie, rising star, 2012. Oh, 
my gosh. It, but well, and that didn't I, seem to I, work. I, yeah, it. because you, you know we were talking well, before. You like thought years. that would be hilarious watching Shaquille O'Neal and and Charles Barkley drafting. But the more I think about it, the more I think uh, this could be like the celebrity All Star game. Yeah, and that is one of the worst things that they've come up with in the last five or six years. It's entertaining. In my opinion. But the game's horrible. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, that's one of the items that I avoid on NBA All-Star Week. And I'm definitely looking up for the three-point challenge. I'm looking up for the dunk contest, and I'm definitely going to watch some of the games uh, until it gets ridiculous, which it typically does. It already is. I know. 190 points? I know. Yeah, I guess I want to see the stars. I want to see them playing together. And I liked the format of West versus East. I've always liked that's the whole point of the NBA is you have the Western Conference in the finals against the Eastern Conference. Right. It's not an, a, a team from, it's not two Western Conference teams. It's not two Eastern, it's a, a Western Conference team and an Eastern Conference team. And that's the way it needs to stay. But when we come back, we'll be going into NB, or I mean the NFL. Yeah, Thursday if, Night Football. And if Rob Gronkowski is still the best tight end in the league. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made her college years happen. Butcha. Opening that education savings account when she was little. Spearheading a campus tour. And another, and another, and another, and another. Bam! Deciphering financial aid. She was like, what? Well, now she's like, yeah! you waste planning for college. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Thursday night football, back again. We've complained about it before, but honestly, looking at this, uh, these two teams, this might be a good game. Pats and Bucks. The Bucks are two and one. They look pretty good with Jameis Winston. They get Doug Martin back this week, and the Pats' offense has been on a roll as well. The thing that's going to make this more exciting is the fact that the Patriots are not the dominating team they were last year. Their defense is, is giving up Horrendous. an almost record-breaking amount of points. They're they're doing like 350 plus through the air and like almost 200 on the ground. They're giving up over 500 yards total. This defense is leaking like a sieve, and it's not good for the Pats long term. But for right now, it does make it more entertaining. The, the offense is doing well with Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, and Danny Amendola, yeah. surprisingly enough. Um, and then they go against the Bucks team, whose defense has been pretty good in the past. It is, it, you know, it's not the way it used to, it's not to its normal standards, but they're still playing well. And like you said, Jameis Winston has, is really doing well starting out in his early career. Yeah, and I think one thing we're looking at is they've added a lot of weapons for him. So obviously he's had Mike Evans for a few years, Cameron Brait, they just added Deshaun Jackson, and now getting Doug Martin back is going to be huge because one of the issues they've had is they have not been able to uh, convert when they're in the red zone. And part of that is their, their kicking. Their kicking's been horrible. But also part of that is they don't have they've not had a running back because Rodgers has been really their starter. They've not had a running back who can eat up clock and help them convert in the red zone. And against this defense, if they have Doug Martin back, that could be something where the Patriots don't see the field very often because they I, I have they've a feeling they've got to keep Brady off the field. That's the it. only way they're gonna win yes. this game. And I think they're gonna do it by a lot of running. And a lot of short to intermediate passing. They don't want to do quick quick scores because no, then it's a foot no, race. You're not going to be Tom Brady. No, no. And plus the fact that their defense right now can't get pressure on the quarterback. And they haven't been able to get pressure on the quarterback, not necessarily against great teams so far this year. And 16% of dropbacks, they're getting pressure. That's not nearly good enough. And for that defense, they cannot get tired out. They have to be off the so field. So are we saying right now what I think we're saying? Is Tom Brady... The Pats defense, the best defense to the Pats have yes. is Tom Brady. Because if that's the case, then Jameis Winston cannot use Deshaun Jackson like he's meant to be used, which no. is a stretch player. You get him the ball, you can score at any moment. If you take that out, then the defense for the Pats can compress it onto the, onto the line, get more of those intermediate, and get into the run game a little bit more. Because they know that they're not going to throw up over the top because if they score quick, here comes Tom but Brady I think, again. I think we'll see Mike Evans, you know, running intermediate routes. They're going to get him the ball. I mean, there's nobody on the Pats that can stop him. 
it's going to be, can Jameis Winston consistently get to him uh, during the game in routes that make sense for this offense? And how quickly, got to and how quickly can Doug Martin get the rust off? Yes. That's another big deal. Yeah. But running backs, in some ways, are the easiest players to come back. Well, because plus he's not coming back from injury. He's coming back from a four-game suspension because of PEDs. So he's been able to do workouts Well, they did and call everything. him the muscle hamster for a reason. <laughs> And he's a he's a very good, in fact, if you look back at the last couple of years, he's been one of the best running backs in the league. So getting back one of the best running backs in the league, perfect timing because yeah. they have to eat up clock in this game. Both teams want to control the clock. I really I really don't know how the Patriots, if they continue the way they're going, are gonna be able to make the playoffs. And if they do make a deep run, you know. Edelman off the bat hurts himself in preseason, tears his ACL, he's gone. Rob Gronkowski, though he has been doing better, he is not the he's old He's not Rob. 100% for sure. And he hasn't been for years. Yeah. The question is with him is not how well he's going to play, but for how long he's going to play. The last couple of years, last year he only had 25 receptions because he was hurt all year long. And in a lot of ways they played better without him. They won the Super Bowl without him. So the question becomes... That, that, that offense with Tom Brady, when it, when it comes to throwing the ball down the field, if you take out Rob Gronkowski, whether in this game, because if the Bucks do play physical, there is a chance that if they do a good job covering him or take him out of the game completely, I don't know how Tom Brady gets the ball down the field. It might just be walking it up, and, yeah. and they have a better chance of stopping They have that. a much better chance of running the ball with Gillespie and then getting James White out in the flat, getting James White in those underneath patterns. If they're going to get it to Gronkowski, it's not necessarily going to be down the field. It's going to be those 10 to 15 routes, and hopefully he's going to run for 5, 10 more. But you're asking for something that the Patriots don't do. Run the ball. Well, they don't do it. They don't have a good hope, offensive line. If you're a Pats fan, you got to hope that Belichick comes out with a different plan. And if you're a fan of so anybody far. else, you hope that the <laughs> Patriots don't do well. No, and, and my prediction is that we are going to see a very close game, but I think the Pats pull it out because they've got Tom Brady. I just can't root. I not root against him. I can't bet against him. He he saw what he did to Houston. And he's having, again, almost a career year. Yeah. He's, he's throwing for an ungodly amount of yards. He hasn't thrown an interception thank, this year. Thank goodness I drafted him. Yeah. He is on pace to throw 48 touchdowns, zero interceptions. If that happens, just just hand him hand him the MVP for the next four years. He didn't even have to play in the playoffs. Just, no. Just, just give him the Super Bowl MVP. <laughs> <laughs> but when we come back, we really do discuss, is Rob Gronkowski the same player he used to be? And if not, is there another 87 in town? Next. Marie, you have prediabetes. Prediabetes? I don't have time to eat right or exercise. I'm a busy mom. Oh, you're a busy mom. Yeah. This is great news. Busy moms never get prediabetes. Wait, what? Let me just... Yeah, this is all the people at risk for prediabetes, and way over here, busy moms. As we discussed in the last segment, Rob Gronkowski arguably has been the most dominant tight end of all time. He is in the first five, six, seven years of his career has been unstoppable. He, he got to the fastest of 25 touchdowns of all time. Uh, you know, he's on pace to break 100 touchdowns in his career, which is ridiculous. Um, I don't know if he'll get up to Tony Gonzalez, but... But that's I mean, just off of injury. That's, that's hard to do. Tony Gonzalez did something that no, nobody expected a tight end ever to do. And it, with Tony Gonzalez, it was longevity. It wasn't production. He wasn't producing the same numbers yeah. as, as Rob Gronkowski. Now, Tony and Gonzalez played for the Chiefs yes. back in the day. Now there's a new Chief in town. And it is Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey, who also wears number 87... What he is doing is unbelievable. He doesn't have the touchdown numbers yet yeah. of Rob Gronkowski because Alex Smith is not, they are not a throw heavy team like the Patriots are. But his numbers have been ridiculous. And let me, and I, excuse me for pulling up my phone, but here is Travis Kelsey's numbers in 2006. So last year, he had 85 receptions for 1,200 and, or 1,125 yards. And he did have a paltry four touchdowns, but like we said, he is not a main yeah, target when they get not, down. This is a running team. Yeah. 
Not the so, system that makes the And so far this year, he is tied with Rob Gronkowski for yards, almost. Literally, it's almost a tie. So he has 21 receptions for 255 yards and two touchdowns. So then we look at Rob Gronkowski. Rob Gronkowski this year has 20 receptions for 318 yards, and he has two touchdowns. So the real question becomes, are they going to be able to keep Rob Gronkowski healthy? And if so, you look at the physical tools of a Travis Kelsey. He's fast. He's big. He has good hands. He is a Rob Gronkowski light. And, right now, and I'm yeah. not saying that he has the same physical abilities that Rob did when he was at his peak. But what I am saying is this guy right now is a better tight end than Rob. Yeah, and I, of I know injuries. a lot of that is because of injuries, exactly. And, and Gronk just keeps seeming to, even when he's able to stay in games, he's not 100%. It looks like he's still struggling with a few injuries. And, and he's turning into a cyborg. And Kelsey is healthy right now, and he's the best tight end in football right now. Cyborg Gronkowski. Because look, now he has that huge arm Brain brace. Chain mail, it looks like. Yeah, and there. then he's going to get a knee. He, I think he has a knee brace. He's turning into a cyborg. The question is, maybe he's leading into maybe computers and Skynet being in, in the NBA. But sorry, sorry, yeah, I got off on a thing. Can Kelsey put up the numbers that Gronkowski can during a year when he's playing with Alex Smith versus Tom Brady? No, I think he needs to wait one year. And one year Patrick is Mahomes. Mahomes come in, and he is from Texas Tech that all they do is throw the ball downfield. Yeah. So I think he just needs to be patient, get those yards. He, he's getting the receptions, he's getting the yardage, he's just not getting and the he's looks. Learning this, and he's learning the system over the past couple of years, and learning that system, you know that Mahomes is going to come in and still play in the same system. We're just going to see more down the field passes. Yes. And I think Kelsey will see more targets. And, Ke and Kelsey has the same matchup advantage over defensive backs and safeties and linebackers as Rob does. He's, he's about six foot six, six foot seven, which is the same size as Rob. He's, he runs about a 4'6", 4'5", which is unbelievable for a guy who's 6'6", 6, 6'7", 6, 6, 260. And, and he has great hands. He has good go body positioning. He can readjust himself in the air. And that's what killed people with Rob Gronkowski. It's impossible for someone who is 5'11", to 6'2", to cover someone who is 5 or 6 uh, inches taller with a bigger, you know, seven, you know, close to 7' foot wingspan and that can put a body on a guy. He's, you know, what, what Rob does is he runs outside a little bit. He does a big loop. He runs outside, puts the defender on the inside of him, turns, puts his back to the defender, puts his hands out, and there's nothing they can do about it. And you know who started that? Tony Gonzalez. Yeah. He did the whole basketball. He was the beginner of, of these types of tight ends these being ex in the These ex-basketball player yeah. put a body out. You know, Tony would go. He wasn't a, a deep field, a deep, uh, he was a Jason Witten type. He wasn't a deep field threat. You know, he could break a tackle and go, but what he would go 10, 15 yards, turn around, put a body on the defender, yeah. and catch the ball out in front of him. And that's why you see teams drafting basketball players or to play yeah, and tight end. Athletes. The Cowboys did it this last year. So I, I'm not surprised. And I think Kelsey can be the best tight end this year. And I wouldn't be surprised because of injury issues with Gronk. If Gronk is able to stay healthy, I think it's going to be close because, I mean, whenever you have Tom Brady as your quarterback, you're always going to be able to put up big numbers as a receiver. Let me drop one last little dime of information. So far this this year, Rob Gronkowski, like I said, 20 receptions, 310 yards. He has a uh, receiving average of 15.9 yards per reception. Which is insane. Which is insane, and that's why it's a deep field yeah. threat. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey is 12.1, but again, he has almost the same numbers with fewer throws down the field because Alex Smith is it's, not a downfield thrower. That's thrower's. their system. Yes, yeah. and so what is going to happen is I promise you if Gronk, Gronk might have more touchdowns at the end of the season, but I think Kelsey will have more receiving yards. And in the next couple of years, that role reversal is going to change because I do see, and, and I don't know if you see this in Gronk, but I do, he could be an amputee and still be playing. He will never stop playing football. You know, and think about it. Most people would have retired by now the amount of injuries he's had. Back surgery, knee surgery, elbow surgery. He's, like I said, a cyborg. And what is going to happen is, is that finally it's going to take a toll on him. He's going to be 70, 60% of what he was before. And Kelsey doesn't seem to get injured as much. And I think that's when he overtakes Gronk. Uh, that'll be it for today. When we come back later this week, we will be talking high school football and a little bit more of the NBA.